This is Obababatunde from SWAT. Why is it taking you so long to get to us? Hey guys, it's Lauren Yates from Rave It Up here. And today we're going to be having a chat over Zoom with Australian jazz musician and trumpeter James Morrison. Before we get into today's interview, we would like to give a shout out to our Patreons, Irene, Bev and Michael. If you haven't heard of Patreon before, it is a great way to support us and keep us running and improving. You pick a membership tier that suits you and your budget per month. And in return for supporting us, we'll give you behind the scenes content and free stuff. You don't have to give much either. You can be a part of our Patreons for as little as $4 a month. Just visit patreon.com forward slash rave it up. You can even donate through PayPal if you don't trust other sites. You can do so just through our email, raveituptv at gmail.com. James, welcome to Rave It Up. It is a pleasure to have you on our show. How are you going Thank today? Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. I, I was just thinking that I've been trying to get you on for quite some time now. And I don't know if your lovely brother, John, has said that he's been on our show back in, I think, 2014. It was so wow. long ago now. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And even uh, your lovely family friend, uh, Carl Risley as well. He's been on yes. in 2013 and 14. So I think we, we've spoken about you got you a lot. So I think it's now time to get your side of the story on things. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> but since this is your first time on our show, James, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And if it's okay, start from the beginning to get sure. a good idea of how you've made it to where you are today. Yep. So you were born in, and sorry if I pronounced this wrong, is it Bur- Burua or Burua? Burua? Brewer, okay. Brewer in Western New South Wales. Yeah, a very yes. small town. <laughs> a rural farming community for our yep. audience. What yes. is it like being from such a small country town like that, especially now that you travel the world and always in capital cities? Yeah, well, it's very different. I mean, we left there. I came to um, Sydney. I was just turning seven. So, you know, the first first that part of my life was living in the country. And um yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of nice to to know that you know home is somewhere like that, um, mm-hmm. or the beginnings are there. But there were no brass instruments there at the time. I'd never seen one when we moved uh, to Sydney when I was seven. The first time I even saw those sort of instruments. The only instruments I'd ever heard was Mum playing the piano um, at home and the organ in church. That was it. Yeah, because I did I did read you too. Your father was a Methodist minister. So yes. is that kind of where you found your love for music, just growing up in the church? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And when we moved to uh, to Sydney, as luck would have it or fate, um, the, the local church we went to uh, in Pitwater in the north of Sydney um, was an unusual one. It had a band and, and the minister played the trombone and they played the blues and they played jazz, you know, gospel uh, blues and jazz. So that was um, obviously meant to be. And were you like, what is this sound? <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I want to do that for sure. Yeah. Is there any other music genres that you really love that we might be surprised at too? I don't know if you'd be surprised. Look, I I like most. Um, you know, I listen to a lot of classical music growing up, and I still do, um, and I, I love that. But I, I love I like what Louis Armstrong um, said when they asked him, you know, do do you do you like rock? And he went, you know, and they said, well, look, is it, it what we mean is, is it good or is it bad music? He said, oh, there's no such thing as good and bad music, just good and bad musicians. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. I mean, yeah. I've heard great, you know, German polka bands, and um, and I'm not particularly into polkas, and I've heard bad jazz, and I'm really into jazz. So you yeah. know, it's it's about the people playing. And it's not even their level of musicianship and skill. That's always great to have. I find it's always the motivation behind the playing is why are you playing it right now? If you're playing because you've got this feeling you want to share and you've got enough skill to share it, then it's it's going to engage me. But if you're playing because um, you're being paid or because you have to or for some other reason, then it almost doesn't matter how well you can play, it very quickly becomes unsatisfying and I'm, and I'm not into it. So, yeah, I, I, I don't kind of, you know, cordon it off into, into genres to what I like. Mm. Um, certainly when it comes time for me to play, I've mainly played jazz and classical music. Yeah. But I've guessed it on a lot of pop albums too. There are trumpet solos and flugelhorn solos and things all over things from In Excess to... Uh, um, um, some more recent things I've done, you know, getting together with people and they say, let's do a collaboration and you, 
you play something and um, it's really exciting sometimes getting into areas you wouldn't normally get into. Yeah, yeah. Definitely want to talk more about the in excess thing a bit later on too and some of the other amazing people you've worked with. But I completely understand. You've got to have that passion behind it, don't you? Otherwise, yeah. it's just, it can get a little bit boring to yeah. watch. Oh, <laughs> oh he's popular turn today. that off. <laughs> well, I, when I was doing my research on you too, besides the trumpet, you know, people might be surprised that you also play trombone, piano saxophone and double bass and i'm probably sure there's some more there too why the trumpet though as your main instrument what made you fall in love with that the most um the trumpet well you know it's it's an instrument that um it's loud it's very <laughs> um, extroverted so it's the one people notice and you know, by your question, it, it's it's it shows what 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 happens. People assume old oh, trumpets the one you love the most. The one it's actually not. Oh, um, it's just the one that I get known for the most. And people see the most. It's not that I love another one more. I don't love any of them particularly any more than any other. They're all tools. Um, one of the analogies I use when people say uh, about being a multi instrumentalist, oh my goodness, how do you switch from the trumpet to the saxophone, and why did you decide to do that? And I sort of say. <clears throat> You're thinking I'm a trumpet player. Mm. I've never thought of myself as a trumpeter or a saxophonist or a pianist. And this is the analogy I use. If you saw someone with a hammer putting nails into some wood that's on a house, you'd call him a builder. Yeah. You wouldn't say he's a hammerer. <laughs> and if you saw someone with the saw, then you wouldn't say, oh, she's a sawer. You'd go, no, she's a builder. That's mm. just the tool she's currently using. I'm a musician. I make music. Holding a trumpet or a saxophone or sitting at a piano just happens to be the tool I'm using at the time to do it. Because I think like that, um, that's why I don't have a favourite one or one that I love the most. You know, you might say, I really I really love playing the trombone. It's it's wonderful, but for different reasons than I love playing the piano. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, and that's what allows me to be a multi-instrumentalist too. I think that's a strange term in a way. I, I'm not silly. I understand that people mainly play one instrument and there is such a thing. But to me, that's like looking at every builder and going, wow, they're multi-skilled. They are. But we just don't think of that. They build houses. You know? well, so, so many instruments I make music. out there. It keeps it fresh and exciting for you, you know? Yes, you yes. Never get bored. It, it means when you come to a certain song and you go, oh, I'd love to hear that with this sound, you go, well, I've got one of those. Yeah. And, and I know play. how to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. But I was also looking at the, the ages that you started learning some of these instruments, like piano at six years old, you took up the brass and, uh, at seven or nine, you formed your first band and at 13, you played professionally in nightclubs. Yeah. Even the, your debut in the US was when you were only 16. Mm. It's so young. Are you really grateful that you got to start off so young or do you feel like it took away a bit of your childhood? Oh, no, no, I had no interest in a childhood. And in, in one, and in the other way, I'm still having my childhood. I never did grow up so, uh, in many ways. But no, no, I, I always had a feeling that there was very little time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mean that I was going to die early. I meant if I live to 100, that's little time for what I want to do. I've always wanted to do so much. I've said, no time to waste. So, you know, start playing now. Take mm -hmm. up, you're going to play the saxophone. Don't say, when I get to high school, take up the saxophone. Do it now. And then start a band now. And then start working in nightclubs now at 13. And then, you know, if I, I need to get on the road. That's what musicians do. So by 16, I was out on the road. And just um, basically, you always had that feeling. Not of, no, it's not, not stress or urgency or panic. It's more, this is awesome. Let's do it now. Mm, like, why, what are we waiting for? Mm. And I've always felt like that. So, um, yeah, that, a whole lot of things happened pretty early. <laughs> getting on the road so young. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. It's yeah. great. And I also never stopped to think, is that reasonable? Like people go, well, is that reasonable? It doesn't come up. And also the other one is people go, well, will that work? Would you be able to? How would you get on the road 16? Never occurs to me how something's going to happen. I find you will need to work that out, but you work it out while you're doing it. I've always found, um, I'll give you a quick example. If I had an idea in my head, oh, I'd like to have a salsa band. The normal procedure would be, to write some music for the band, book some players, get them together, have a rehearsal, create a salsa band, and then go and get some work for it. Mm. That'll never happen with me. I'll just keep thinking about having a salsa band and I'll never do it. I'm inherently lazy, that's one thing, which might not sound like it goes with the do everything now, but it does. What I do if I wanna have a salsa band is I book a gig. 
I find a venue, talk to a manager, whatever, and say, yes, I put my salsa band. Like, we got a salsa band. I go, I will have. I don't tell them that. <laughs> Once the gig's on and there's a deadline, there's a date, and they start advertising it and people are coming, that then motivates me to write the music, get the band together and do it. And yeah, so that's, um, that's I, I do everything like that. And so I start like that. So the idea of, well, you're only 15. How are you going to be on the road when you're 16? And you go, assume you're going to be. What would you do next? And you do that rather than going, once I've done everything, I'll see if it takes me on the road. You go, no, I'm going on the road next year. People go, well, you're not even in a band that's going on the road. Go, it doesn't matter. I'm going on the road. And then things start to fall into place. And you start to do the things you would do if you're going that. on the road next year. And lo and behold, you end up on the road. <laughs> good, some advi- good advice for our listeners today too. <laughs> but were your parents a bit worried that you were going on the road so young? Did they come with you or...? No, no, definitely not. Um, And look, I started working nightclubs when I was 13. And so, you know, nightclubs to a, you know, mum and dad, a Methodist minister, and I were, were, you know, not not such a great idea, if I put it that way. But they understood it was for music. It wasn't about I wanted to go out clubbing, I wanted to play music. Mm. And so they were they were amazing. They just sort of said, well, as long as it's for music, um, basically, I could do whatever. Mum told me many years later, that she also they discussed it. And they said, He's going to do it anyway. Our choice is not whether to let him do it or not. It's whether we're involved. Mm. Which was really enlightened, I think, sort of view to take of it. And looking back, they were right. I was just going to do it. If I got an offer to go with a band and play and mum and dad said no, I just would have snuck out the window and gone. I know I would have. So, um, yeah, I was going to do it anyway. So they knew that. They said, well, it's better if we say yes and then we can be involved and say now make sure you do this, make sure that, you know, and look after yourself. So, Yeah. So they, they were very supportive. <laughs> and I, I do remember back when I interviewed your brother, John, back in 2014, that he actually said he started playing the trumpet before you. Is that correct? Like, let's hear your true. side of the story with things about now he that. Was, he was older, so he got to join. When I, we arrived in the city, I wasn't quite old enough to join the school band. And um, him being older, he could join right away. So he joined the band, started playing the cornet in the brass band. He went to the tuba also. So uh, before he went to the drums. So, uh, yeah, he played trumpet Friday. In fact, I wanted to join the band and couldn't. And he would bring his corn at home and put it under the bed. And he'd be out playing or doing something with friends. I would sneak into his room and get under the bed and take the corn out. And I didn't come out because I thought he might come in. So I'd stay under the bed playing the corn. So funny enough, here's me with the career I've got now and who I am. My first notes were played hiding under a bed. Bed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he, he was saying that he taught you. I don't know how true that oh, is. Oh, listen, we might we might be getting a bit. No, he did show me some stuff. He did, because I said, how do you do this? What's that button? What do you do? You know, yeah, he did. He did. Oh, that's good. Bit of recognition for you today, John. <laughs> <laughs> so you studied at the Sydney Conservatory of Music. So I'm guessing it was always jazz and being in the music industry for you. But did you have any other careers in mind as well? Or, you know, what oh, was a bit of the plan B? <laughs> oh, no, no plan B. No Good. plan B. And just before I, I talk you. about the careers, I absolutely, uh, I started teaching very early too. It's always been part of my DNA to pass on. And so I had students when I was 12. Wow. Um, like, and I don't mean just like casually teaching some people. I mean, parents would bring their kids to me for lessons. Hmm. And um, I think I got $2 a lesson, which was huge. Um, but I, I started teaching very early and I remember one day I would have been probably only 14 and um, his name was Rory. Rory had bright orange hair and played the trombone and he might have been eight years old. So, you know, I was 14. I was much older. And his yeah. mum came at the end of the lesson one day and she said, now, Rory, um, um, I'm going to ask James. And I thought, oh, what's this about? And she said, Rory wants to be a trombonist, wants to be a musician. I said, great. And she said, but I've told him he needs to still keep studying in school hard because He needs a backup in case that doesn't work out and doesn't become a musician. What do you think, James? And I looked at Rory, and of course, there's wrong answer. A parent's asking me that. I'm a 14-year-old. I'm supposed to support the parent and say, yes, a good idea, Rory. Do your schoolwork, and we'll work hard together on the trombone. That's the answer I'd give today. (laughs) As a 14-year-old, I said, I looked at Rory with his mum standing right there. So what do you think? He said, oh, well, yeah. And he's looking at his mum and says, yes, I I should have a a backup plan. I said, well, if you think you need a backup plan, you're going to need the backup plan because only people who are completely dedicated to music make it. Mm. And his mother just looked at me horrified. He's, going, he's, he's eight, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> but that's how I thought. I would never have a backup plan. The idea, what if music doesn't work out, means it already hasn't, like in your mind, like you're, you're giving up. 
Um, the only people that make it, and I still believe this, although I'd be a little bit more circumspect with how I'd talk to an eight-year-old now, but um, I still believe that it's, whilst it's an amazing life and a joy and what a privilege and a blessing to spend your life playing music for people and lifting their spirits, nonetheless, it's not easy to make a career. And only those who say, this is what I'm doing, there is no plan B, there's no backup, because if I've got a backup, you will take it at some point. Yeah, it you from that go, no, I, And the ones that make it, the ones that say, the reason I don't have a backup is because I will not do anything else. This is what I'm going to do. That's enough determination to make it. Having said that, there were lots of other things I wanted to be, and I've been them. So I wanted to be a yeah. bus driver. Okay. I always wanted to be a bus driver. I used to watch the guy, the bus driver. His name was Curly. He told me his name was Curly. <laughs> um, and Curly drove the bus, the school bus, and I'd sit right behind him. He let me sit right behind him and watch him change the gears and drive. And I drive the bus when the band goes on tour. I got my bus license. Oh, and fantastic. when I've taken big bands on the road, I drive. So I got to do that anyway as mm -hmm. well. Always wanted to be a pilot. My dad flies, my brother flies, my sister flies. So I got my pilot's license and I fly my band around. So I'm a pilot too. Um, always wanted to be a sailor and I sailed uh, as a teenager and competitively and everything. And so I ended up getting a, a license for that too. And I, and I sailed and I've sailed all over the world and all sorts of things. So basically lots of other things I wanted to be and I am. Just and a rally driver too. Instead of music. I, I, I wanted to drive trucks too. And I did get a job for a while. I want to drive big trucks and we're delivering bridge girders. Like we're talking big trucks. You had to be 18 to get that license. As soon as I was 18, I got the license. I got a job. But they start at six in the morning. Oh. And you've got to be there like at 5.30 to get the truck ready and get going. And I was finishing playing at a nightclub called the Paradise Jazz Cellar at four. So I'd finished playing at four and then have to be at the truck at 5.30. I did it for about six months and I went, actually this is not working because i actually i'm going to fall asleep driving the truck so i gave that one up but i still got to do it yeah and i still have the truck license and anytime anyone needs anything big moved i'm your guy <laughs> <laughs> i love that and a rally driver too i did read is that wanted correct? to be a racing car driver as you say when you're a young boy and but yeah i fell in love with rallying and did that and ended up um d doing that um uh you know to to a, to a high level too and getting signed to drive for um uh, a team and all sorts of things i, I had an absolute ball and um, I gave that one up because another great little anecdote, three times world champion. I better check that's correct. I know it's at least three, but like one of the greatest rally drivers of all time, Ari Vartanen. And anyone listening who knows their rallying will go, well, he's one of the, it's like saying Charlie Parker in, or Dizzy Gillespie in music, you know. Ari is a friend and a mentor. And um, he came to me during a rally that we were both in. And he said, um, do you have to do this? And I said, what do you mean? He said, the rallying. And I said, well, yeah, I'm signed to do it. I've got a car. And he said, no, no, I don't mean this rally. I mean, do you have to be a rally driver? I said, well, I love it. I want to do it. And he said, but I mean like music. You know, you have to do that because it's what you are. You wouldn't be you if you didn't play music. Do you have to rally drive? And I said, well, put like that. No, I guess not. And he said, then stop. And I said, why? And he said, because I've watched you drive for the last three days up close. And he said, there are only two outcomes possible. I'm going, yes. And I'm thinking, this guy's three times world champion. Like he's, you know, he said, the two possible outcomes are you're either going to win or you're going to die. And he was quite serious because people do die. It's a very dangerous sport. Yeah. And he said, he's, but get this, it is, it is funny. I'm going somewhere funny. He said, you're either going to win or you're going to die. And he said, and you're not going to win because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a and, good one. <laughs> but what he meant was you're going to keep driving faster until you win and you're not going to win. So you're going to keep going faster until you crash. And, um, and so I thought, oh, okay. I said, thanks for the advice. And I'm thinking about that. And this really happened later that day. I had a big crash. I was fine, but I had a big crash. And then later that same day, my wife called me and said, guess what? I'm pregnant. This was our first son. I'm going to be a father. And I just looked up and I said, okay, I can take a hint. Like, I'll stop rally driving. Like <laughs> in one day up. I get told I'm going to die. Then I have a big crash. Then I find out I'm a father. Okay. So I gave up doing it seriously. I still love to drive and I do it for fun. And, um, you know, and uh, I do lots of driving, but uh, I decided to sort of give up the, uh, the those aspirations because I thought I better take the hint. Oh, I love that you always have the so many side things. Like, you know, you're not just a musician. You already knew about the pilot because obviously talking to John and sure. Carl Risley is obviously a pilot too. Like it's yes. just, it's all within you guys. But I also did read Inventor as well. Is that still, what have you invented? <laughs> um, yes, they put that in there. I want to say they who was writing the bios. And, and, and look, it's true. Um, 
uh, I've worked on a number of things. One of them is the digital trumpet. Um, and with a, a, a genius, I'm certainly not the genius in that one. It's um, a guy named Steve Marshall. Um, and he's a robotics expert and all this sort of thing. And he came to me after a gig one day and said, I've made this digital trumpet. And I said, you've made a what? And he said, well, I'd like to get your opinion on it. And he's like an amateur trumpet player, but a professional, you know, robotics expert. And he showed me this thing. And there were all sorts of things about it that I would change. And I said, well, that's not what he said. Yeah, I can't work out how to do that. But he said, do you want to work together on it? Do you want to create something? And so we did. And we ended up creating this digital trumpet and it ended up um, was being sold out of New York and people all over the world have got them now. The, the MDT, the Morrison Digital Trumpet. Wow. This was back when that was kind of a hip thing to do, I guess, in the 90s, you know. And I've still got one and um, it's, it's a cool thing. But, um, yeah, that, that was – and there's been some other things along the way too, some gadgets and some things that I've, I've gotten involved in designing and, um, and, and, you know, coming up with ideas. And I just love that. I, um, I love using your imagination to say, what if, mm. and, then, and then come up with something. And um, that was a lot of fun. You and you. Um, you. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there, there are people in New York playing digital trumpets. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could technically say you also invented your own school as well, your own Academy of Music in Mount Gambier. That's technically an invention as well. And I'll... Yeah, okay, we're stretching it, but yeah, that's yeah, more. Yeah. But, uh, that, take that it, will... take it, James. And that came about, having a school came about simply because I've taught, as I've already said, all my life. Mm. And as I started touring more and more, I stopped having, you know, regular Thursday afternoon lesson for so-and-so and just would teach along the way, do master classes, they call them, you know, and visit schools and, and universities. And um, I would visiting universities, I would go, well, that's a great idea. And then you'd see things, you go, well, if I had a school, I wouldn't do that. I'd do it like this. And I ended up with this great long list as if I had a school, I'd do it like this. And finally, I thought, you know what, if you're ever going to do that, now's the time. So about seven years ago, um, I got together and my wife, Judy, and I, we created it. And it's a university, um, a bachelor degree. And um, we set it up to do things. And I got some fantastic faculty, people I knew were of like mind and wanted to sort of teach a different way. And um, we did that for seven years. We've closed that now in that form. And um, I've gone back now to the on the road thing and teaching where I am rather than having a building because I found um, as amazing as it was to spend more time with students, not just sort of see them and then, you know, for a few weeks or a few days or even a few hours, um, that it running an institution is mostly about paperwork not about teaching music admin. And, and even the teaching you are then tied down to the one place and the one set of people. Mm. And um, as much as I loved it, as much as there've been some great outcomes from it, I thought, no, I think it suits me more to be out there moving around and teaching and passing on my, uh, and I think it more like that of passing on uh, what I, you know, have to offer to whoever I'm with. Mm. And just sponsor heaps of uh, music, you know, uh, up and coming musicians and Absolutely. paying it forward to the younger generation, you know, the mm -hmm. next people to fill your shoes, which yep. I just love that. Just keep paying it forward. <laughs> yes. Now, I know the internet doesn't always feature true statements, so I was hoping maybe you can clarify some things for us today about mm -hmm. some of the people that you have worked alongside, some amazing artists. So correct me. For some reason, on the internet, said Quincy Jones and Ray yes. Charles, BB yes. King, Whitney mm -hmm. Houston. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Frank They're Sinatra, all true. Sting, and Ray Brown, and obviously In Excess that we spoke about earlier. Yep. Are all those true? They're all true. Um, <laughs> in, in some of them in different ways. So, for instance, um, go back to the beginning of the list. Um, uh, Quincy Jones and Quincy Ray is. Charles. No, Quincy yeah. is is I'm very you know um, happy and humble to say he's a friend. And I've played with him a number of times. And we think the first thing I did, I don't know if it's the first, but I did his 75th birthday celebrations. And um, there's a video of that out there. You can go on, on YouTube. And if you put in Quincy Jones, 75th birthday, James Morrison, you'll see me there with Quincy and playing and with some amazing people. I did a thing with Chaka Khan and with um, uh, all the, and, and um, uh, his name's gone out of my head. Genesis, drummer, can you believe? Phil Collins um, was on that and all sorts of people. So, uh, yes, that's true. And uh, Ray Charles, I toured with right around the world. B.B. King toured with right around the world. Wow. Um, of course, in excess, we've mentioned recorded with them. And Whitney, um, uh, Whitney Houston and Frank Sinatra was all on the one night. Wow. So when they opened, um, so that's what I say in different ways. Some of these are people I've toured with and played with a lot. Uh, both of them, Frank Sinatra and Whitney Houston, we were on the same concert. And um, it was the, uh, the opening of Sanctuary Cove, would you believe? They up in Queensland, they called it the ultimate event and they weren't kidding. 
Um, I was there uh, with also with Ricky May and um, and Peter Allen was on the show too. Can you believe on the one concert, Whitney Houston, wow. Frank Sinatra, and I've got to tell you, I'm backstage. And they said, um, they said, uh, Mr. Morrison, stand right here. Um, it's time for you to meet Mr. Sinatra. He'll be arriving in a minute. And I went, oh, great. Mm-hmm. You know, wow. I'm standing there backstage, open air. You know, it's this big grassed area behind this huge sound shell. And these four limousines pull in. And I thought, oh, wow, it's like a president arriving, you know. And all these guys in suits, got big guys in suits, got out of the limousines. I thought, where's Frank? They were the limos for the bodyguards. What? <laughs> they formed a perimeter and then the helicopter came in and landed, having flown straight over from Marlon Brando's boat. I mean, I'm dropping so many names here. We'll pick them all up later. Yes, he's I know. staying on Marlon Brando's boat while he's in Australia. He flies over in the chopper from the boat, lands behind the stage, gets out of the helicopter. They're walking him over and they go, Mr. Sinatra, this is James Morrison, who'll be playing the you know, trumpet soloist and all that, and hello and all that. And he was, um, he was, you know, pleasant enough. We didn't stop and sort of have a coffee. Um, but it was amazing. What a legend, you know, and all the, you know, recordings I had of Frank Sinatra and just, just to be there for that and to meet him and, uh, and to see him up close, you know, doing yeah. I love Frank Sinatra. I'm, oh, a, yeah. I'm a bit of an old soul. Like give me anything oh, yeah. Frank Sinatra. I'm like, Oh, yeah. just goosebumps that voice. My yeah. goodness. And of course, Whitney, her voice, she was amazing, you know, just yeah. incredible. Do you have so, a yeah, that, that, that was you... some night and Peter Allen, I've always been a fan, you know, what an amazing performer. Um, he was so yeah some concert yeah have, have, do you actually have a favorite is that a little bit hard to pick that you've worked a too lot? hard different reasons yeah different yeah. different people you know i mean an example on the tour with ray charles and bb king i mean talk about they were on the one tour on the same tour three months we were right around the world and you go well you needed both of them in the one concert yeah. <laughs> um but so soulful such amazing performers amazing voices amazing instrumentalists and yet so different. That'll give you a good example. Ray Charles walks in for um, the re- first rehearsal. We're in New York for a three-month tour right around the world. And he's got a guy behind him wheeling a trolley with a three-drawer filing cabinet on it, you know, like a metal tall filing cabinet on a trolley. That's all the music. So we can Gosh. start rehearsing. And it's a big band. It's like a 20-piece wow. band. And he can say, hey, why don't we do this song? And the guy just goes to the filing cabinet, pulls out all the music and hands it out. So kind of over the top organized, like I would have bought a, you know, a case with the music, a filing cabinet, but that's Ray, very organized. Everything's nailed down. He said, here's how we're going to do the songs. We'd rehearse them. He'd stop in the middle of a song, remembering he's blind, right? He's not reading the music. And he'd stop in the middle of a song and he'd say, Our trumpets, bar 53, fourth trumpet, that's an F sharp. And you go, really? Wow. <laughs> so he was amazing, but he was that level of detail. He wasn't just out in the front singing the band. He, he, everything had to be just how he wanted it. It was amazing. Next, uh, two days later, BB arrives for his rehearsals. He walks in for a three month tour with a big band. He's got his guitar, Lucille, as he called her, and nothing else. And he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a little piece of paper and says, I've written down a couple of ideas for tunes we might do. <laughs> no music. Now, and some tunes we might do, some ideas, like the yeah. opposite end of the spectrum. And yet they both on stage present as these unbelievable performers and very bluesy and kind of similar-ish in style, but such a different way of getting there. Mm. And so I loved what Ray did and how he did it, and I loved what BB did and how he did it, but for totally different reasons. So BB said to the band, you guys just play what you want behind me. We'll just play some blues. We'll have some fun. And that is awesome. But it was also awesome to play these incredible charts and get them just right the way Ray Charles wanted them. So, and you know, all of the people on the list are all different and for different reasons. I think what I loved getting back to a question you asked earlier about music, the musical styles, what I loved is all of those people on that list did it because they were passionate about it because they loved it because it's who they were. No one was there clocking on, you know what I mean? And doing their job. And I think that's, um, that's what I love most. Oh, what amazing opportunities you've gotten over your career and worked really oh, yeah. hard for it, though, too. It's good you can kind of learn from all of these amazing legends. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, of course, the jazz legends like Dizzy Gillespie, you mentioned Ray Brown there. We toured together for some years and made a number of albums together. Just incredible, you know, to, to have that connection to jazz history, to these people that, you know, Ray Brown, you know, played with Count Basie, with Dizzy Gillespie, with Oscar Peterson, with you know, so there's this connection to this part of jazz history that's um that quite frankly is missing in the time i grew up living in australia now i get students that at the drop of a hat go over to new york you know to check someone out or to have some lessons which is awesome Mm. but 
back when I was coming up, you know, the idea that you might one day see one of them perform live was a dream, let alone meet them, let alone play with them. Mm. So I'm, I'm really lucky. I, I've ended up being able to play with most of my record collection. Wow. I know. You talk about a pinch me moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, And you've also been able to play and perform for incredible people like Queen Elizabeth, may she rest in peace, and for US presidents like Bush and Clinton. And then in 2016, you actually got to go to the White House and meet President Obama. When you have like that, those important people that you're performing for, and even, you know, in 2000, you got to do the Olympic Games. Do you ever still get nervous? No. But I have to answer that question so way you said still. So you assume that once upon a time I did. I never did. So I don't still not get nervous or get nervous. I, I never did. Um, wow. Nerves don't come into it because, and I lecture on that. I, I help people with, with nerves um, and performance anxiety. And, and basically um, it's all to do with, with certain questions you're asking in your mind when you go to perform. It's how you get nervous about anything. But I never got nervous because instead of being nervous about it, I'm there to make music. This is a happy occasion. This is a joyous thing. It's not a test. You, if you construct the whole thing in your mind, and remember everything's just constructed in your mind about you know what's actually going on as you're standing, and you said important people. I'm, I'm jumping around here. I'm trying to think how to start, where to start. Important people. Yes, there's no. I'm not silly. The president of the United States, say, playing at the White House for Barack Obama and 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 all sorts of you know dignitaries and people. Yeah, I I understand they're important people in the affairs of the world. But what's really happening is a human being standing there with an instrument and another bunch of human beings sitting there listening to it and we're all hearing the music and being inspired by it. The fact that their job when they're not doing that might be present of the United States or might be I drove a truck, you know, yesterday delivering goods like if because in the audience, I'm sure they're often truck drivers. Um, what difference does that make to what's actually going on, which is we're sharing music? None. And so I said, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not silly. I understand you're playing for the president. That's, you know, do a good job. But I do the same job when I'm playing for the guy that, you know, delivered my groceries yesterday or picked up the rubbish. Doesn't make any difference. It's about the music, not about what job the people have you playing to. And so it's a great honour to be invited to play for presidents, queens, you know, and, and, and absolutely, you know, heads of state. Yes, of course. It's an acknowledgement that you, you know, are doing well in your field. Yes. And you're representing a country and all those things. I understand that. But when it comes time to actually play, that's when you would get nervous. So I can sit and think about that and go, wow, what an honor. Isn't that incredible? Wow, I'm really lucky. Yes. But when it's time to actually play, there's people in front of me and I'm standing there and I'm a person too. And, and it's all about the music. It's not about me. It's not about them. It's about us sharing the music. And so I never get nervous. Never have. Don't get nervous because... There's nothing to be nervous about. I, 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 the word I want to say is it's inappropriate, if mm. you know what I mean. Not that it's wrong, but it's like it's like saying, "Oh, do you get nervous when you take a shower?" And you go, "What?" <laughs> like that's an inappropriate question, not because it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. And so, mm. do you get nervous when you're sharing music, the, the greatest thing you know, with people and inspiration? You go, "What?" And I again, I get people get nervous performing. I don't perform. I just we just share music. Share you know? music. I and, love no, it. Yeah, that's how that's how it feels to me. So. Yeah, it's, it, and um, to someone who is nervous performing when I'm working with, with students particularly who are nervous and want to get over that, have a whole process I take them through to, to get them to a place where the uppermost thing in their mind, in their body, in their whole, you know, being, when they go to play is, oh, we're about to make music. Mm. Not I'm about to play for some people. Notice all the different words. I'm doing something for them. I'm playing. It's about me, them. It's all. You go, oh, that's all so separated. And also you're going to get nervous. I would get nervous. If I had to play for the president of the United States, that would make me nervous. Mm. But I don't. I shared some music with some people. Share music. <laughs> I love it. I, yeah. I think that's an amazing way to finish off today. <laughs> oh, I yeah. wanted to know, because you've already achieved so much in your career, James, what else can we expect from you in the future? Is there any live shows coming up that the audience can wait and look forward to? I know look, we I'm, just I'm... missed out on your 60th birthday celebrations. Sorry about that. <laughs> Not to worry. Look, I'm always touring. There's always things coming up. Nothing specific, because remember the way I work, I wait till I get an idea and then we just go and do it. So mm. I don't know what's coming next. And to me, that's the most exciting answer I can give to that question. Yeah. Um, I know some people go, I've got all these plans and I'm fascinated and I admire them. But for me, the most exciting thing is just, I have no idea. Um, I, I'm, I'm as excited to see what happens as any of my you know fans are. So uh, let's I'm see. I'm excited too. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, we are unfortunately getting to the end of the interview now, James, but as a closing statement, and what was probably the most important question here on Rave It Up, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 14 year old self? Oh, wow. Well, the first thing is, don't be so hard on Rory and his mum. Uh, but apart <laughs> from that, um, uh, what would I tell my 14 year old self? You know what, I'd have no advice whatsoever. I would just say to my 14 year old self, oh boy, are you in for a ride? Have fun. I'll see you at the other end. Yes. <laughs> you got amazing opportunities coming up. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Just do what you do. Have fun. You're going to have a ball. That's what I would say. Yeah. And if our audience want to contact you or find out what you're up to in the future, go buy tickets in the future, where should we go follow you? Uh, JamesMorrison.com is the easiest thing here to find out what's going on. And there's Facebook pages and Instagram things and all that going on too. Yeah. But that's a good starting point. I'll make sure to put all the links below for everybody so they can go Thank follow you. you. And yep. I hope to finally come to one of your shows in the future. That's That'd be great. on my list. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, James. I know Thank you. you're such a busy man, so I really appreciate your time. Not right before all. Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. But Merry Christmas, and I hope to have you on again in the future. Maybe next year we can chat about something else. That'd be great. There'll be some new things to talk about. Yeah, I look yeah, forward absolutely. to it. You'll have a great Christmas too. Keep in contact, all right? Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope you all enjoyed today's interview. If you'd like to check out any of our other interviews, please visit our website, raveituptv.com. All of the podcasts and videos are there for you to enjoy. And while you're on our website, please also check out our books. One, Knowing What I Know Now, as well as a mini ebook that I have written called Staying Strong, Finding Inner Peace During Hard Times. If you'd like to further support us here at Rave It Up as well, please visit patreon.com forward slash rave it up. You can pick a membership tier that works with you and your budget for as little as $4 a month. And in return, you get a lot of free stuff and bonus content at Rave It Up. Perfect for some really big Rave It Up fans. But for now, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.